everyone, and welcome to days 32, 33, and 34 of our RV10 build. On these days, we continued work on the horizontal stabilizer. Yes, I went ahead and combined all three of these days into one because there's a lot of repetition. It's a lot of the same stuff on both sides, the top and the bottom, and the left and the right of the stabilizer. So it just made more sense to kind of condense all of them into one video for y'all. So let's get started. Something I wanted to go over really quickly here at the beginning was a comment that was left on the last video where someone had mentioned they were concerned about using this, what I'm calling soft cradle with the dog leashes that we can maneuver the piece back and forth versus the rigid cradle using the pieces of wood cut out to match the ribs like they have in the directions. I just wanted to make sure to clarify that there is no concern with this particular piece about um, the alignment of the stabilizer based on the quality of the cradles. It specifically says actually on 8-7 in step 5 when it's telling you to make the cradles, at the very last sentence it says don't waste time making the cradles perfect. They have no bearing on the alignment of the stabilizer. So I just wanted to make sure to put that out there in case that was something else any of y'all were concerned about. Um, I know that yes, there are definitely parts where it really does matter about having everything held in place perfectly and trying not to put any sort of a twist in it, but I just wanted to clarify that this was not one of those cases, and so we were not concerned because of what it specifically said here in the instructions. We weren't concerned with using this different method with this different cradle. It still seemed like the best option for us and what we wanted to try to, to get out of it with the extra maneuverability after we'd seen Jason use a really similar setup with his plane. It was really great having both of us here working on the horizontal stabilizer with Tyler able to operate the rivet gun while I maneuvered the bucking bar and then checked on the shop heads after we'd riveted them. But one thing that's really important, I think, is to kind of come up with a good little lingo or jargon that you want to use because the thing we kind of found out um, is that if you're just sitting here going, oh, well, it needs a little bit more, it's not quite there, hit it a little bit longer. It was just really vague. And so kind of having a good little jargon where we knew each other was ready to go, we knew about how much to keep going. So we will say either ready or on to make sure to communicate to each other that we actually are both ready to go. And then the couple terms that we came up with is a single tap and a double tap. So if looking at the shop head, it's just not quite right. The idea for us was that a single tap was basically trying to just hit it once more, a single time with the rivet gun, like a really brief little hit. And the double tap being that maybe it needed like two or three little quick hits. Um, it's, it might sound silly, but it's come in really helpful for us to have this understanding because if I say it, Tyler knows exactly how long I think that he needs on the rivet gun and vice versa if he's the one with the bucking bar and I'm the one with the rivet gun. So it just, it's cut down on a lot of, no, that's not enough or, oh, we need a little bit more. It, instead of being kind of with vague concepts, having a little bit of an understanding about what it is that you're needing uh, has really helped out a lot. This next little bit here is really random, but I happened to notice it while I was going through the videos and I thought it was really cute and funny. You've probably seen our dogs walking around in a couple of the videos by this point and hadn't noticed, but one of them, Jasmine, was trying to come out to see what we were up to and just take a look at what happens when she comes around the corner. Ready? Ready? Bless her heart, poor little thing. Yeah, neither of them were really big fans of the drill or the compressor or the rivet gun for the longest time, but they've both gotten a lot more comfortable with the noises and everything out there. So you'll be seeing a lot more of them, I'm sure, in all the other future videos. So I mentioned briefly in the last video about how tight it gets there when you're trying to get your hand with the bucking bar in the area between the two stringer assemblies. And a couple things with that. One, 
on top of it being kind of hard to get your hand in there, you can't see the shop heads of the rivets that are on the bottom half of each of the stringer assemblies. By bottom half, I'm talking about when you're looking at it here, it's the forwardmost half of the stringer assemblies, but just saying bottom to try and help make sense if you're sitting here looking at what we're working on. And that made it difficult to try and see the shop heads and the sizes and to also try and get the rivet gauge under there and see how they were hit, like if they were actually set properly. And so we would asked our technical advisor from our local EAA chapter about this and he had a pretty neat uh, suggestion that we've used a lot since then whenever we get into either a tight space where I can't fit the rivet gauge or a place like this where you really just can't see it. And it's a really simple suggestion, but it worked out really well. He said, take your finger and push it against the shop head for a second or two until it makes a little bit of an indentation on your finger. Pull your finger out and take a look at the size of the indentation that that shop head has made on your finger. And you can then compare it to the holes that are there on the rivet gauge to try to see if it looks like that indentation matches the size that's there on the rivet gauge and see if it looks like it's been set properly. It's obviously not very exact, but again, if you're in a tight space and you don't really have any other option it's better than nothing so it's worked out really nicely and once again really glad that we have our great tech advisor Joe to help us out when we have some questions like this but one other thing with having that tight little area the stringer assemblies um, you always have to hold that bucking bar vertically because you have all the different clecos there holding the skin to the spar and the way, at least for me, that I had to orient my hand to try and hold that bucking bar vertically to keep it from um, hitting the clecos that were on either side, it put just this one little part of my wrist um, right up against the stringer assemblies. And so while I'm sitting there holding it and trying to buck it, it just kind of kept knocking it over and over and over again. It wasn't anything where when it got hit, it was particularly painful. But by the end of these days, uh, I did have some substantial little bruises there. To be fair, I bruise like a peach, so maybe it's just me. But I don't know if perhaps if I'd worn gloves or something, if that would have helped out a lot or what. Um, maybe like a tennis wristband. I don't know if there's any sort of little padding there. But it was just something from having to fit your hand in there between the stringer assemblies on both the top and bottom side of both halves of the horizontal stabilizer. It was just a lot of repeated little um, hits there on the same spot on your wrists. So maybe gloves, maybe something, I don't know, just putting it out there for whenever you get to this point. If you're wondering why we just flipped over the horizontal stabilizer and shook it, we were trying to shake out uh, the shop heads for the rivets that we had drilled out just to make sure we got everything out from inside of the stabilizer before moving on. So we're now into day 34 here in the video, and by the end of this day, we will have finished riveting the skins top and bottom for both sides to the flanges of the front spar assembly, the stringer assemblies, and all of the in-spar ribs. We really did enjoy having this soft cradle. As you've probably seen now in the video, we had moved the horizontal stabilizer back and forth quite a bit to either give Tyler better access when he's using the rivet gun, but then to be able to flip it back so that I could get a better view of the shop heads for the rivets to make sure they've been set properly. Uh, it really was nice having that also with the scaffolding set up there. One thing to point out again, I'd mentioned this in a previous video and here you're gonna be able to see what I was talking about. I used foolishly uh, nails to put the cradles together instead of wood screws. And so if you're looking here at the video, uh, the two cradles at the back there, on you can see on the right side that the, the sides there are leaning in. They are no longer completely vertical. And that's because they were just coming loose from the nails. And so I'd have to stop periodically and get out the hammer and try to hammer them back together. It still worked out fine. You can see here we got through these three days without any problems. Um, but if you're going to go ahead and build your own, don't be foolish like me. Use wood screws instead 
instead of nails, it'll be much more sturdy. And also, again, we use the two by fours here, but like I mentioned before, you would probably wanna use something thinner um, because the width there of the two by four blocked a lot of the different rivet holes. It still worked out fine. We would just shift the horizontal stabilizer back and forth in the cradle to get access to the different um, holes that had previously been blocked by the cradle, but just to avoid having to deal with that so much, if you made thinner cradles than what we did, um, you wouldn't have that same problem. But it felt really great to get so much done and accomplished in just a couple of days and a couple of hours each day to see all the Clecos come out and to see all the rivets in place instead. Um, you can see here at the end how cool it looks to really see what looks like it's actually going to be a piece of your plane now that you don't have all the Clecos there sticking out of it. So it was just, it was great. It, again, it's fun because it's the biggest piece that you'll have worked on at this point. And so there was just a really big like sense of accomplishment seeing this come together finally. Um, it, it was just exciting. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to give me a thumbs up and make sure to subscribe to my channel to follow along as we build our RV10. If you'd like to stay more up to date on our current build status, you can follow me on Instagram at plain.lady to see exactly where we are in the build each day.